Everyone's very quiet this morning. Are you awake? Okay. <laughs> hey, that's all right. You got to wake up just a little bit because in just a minute, we're going to do some praise and some worship. And I know you're going to wake up then because he's worthy, right? Okay. All right. Now, I was just telling Claire, if you watch this talk up here, um, I have not read this verse in a while. It's one of my favorites. And I happened to read it again this week, so I'm going to read it to you. And of course, where do you think it's found? <laughs> I love y'all. <laughs> y'all are my people. I so love that. This one is Psalm 37 in particular. But listen to this. This is verse 23. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. <sighs> This is not a faraway God that just sits up in heaven and plays chess with us like some people believe. No, he delights. He takes joy in every detail of our life. That's a personal God. That's good. Now, I have to read this one too because it's right next to it. And um, this is my story. Okay, so I'm going to read it to you. Verse 25 says this. Once I was young and now I am old. That's part of my story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you're awake. Okay, you're with me. Once I was young, now I'm old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Never. That's my real story. Listen, there's a lot in this world that we could want, okay? God's not going to give me everything I want because, you know, there's some stuff I want, but it's just stuff. But everything I need, He has provided. Great is thy faithfulness. <laughs> Sorry, I slipped into a hymn there, but that's all right. Because y'all knew that one too. Let's stand together and let's get ready to go before Him and worship. And thank Him for His faithfulness and for all He's done for us. God, You are good. You are good. You're not just good, You're good to us. And for that, we are grateful. Thank you for bringing us into your house again this week together with your family and with your people, but most of all with you, Holy Spirit. You are here to do your will and your work in this place, in and through us, and we thank you for that. God, as we enter into this time of praise and of worship and of adoration to you, let our song, let our, let our praise be, let it be sweet unto you God let it rise to you like a sweet smelling fragrance God for you are good you are worthy and we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus name amen Yeah. 
shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise today, Lord. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, come on. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. We're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. If we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Oh, come on, there's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. If we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Oh, we were. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, we were, we were beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on and give Him a shout this morning if He's been good to you. Lord, you're a good God. We thank you for how good you are. You are good to me. 
Friendship this life brings suffering. Lord, I will so good. Oh God, God, you're so this is a song we could sing to you forever and it would never be enough you are so good you are so good to us personally God we've sang in two songs this morning about your kindness there's a lot of ways you could have chosen to save us to interact with us your plan could have been very different if you had wanted it to be. But you showed us kindness and mercy. Jesus, you gave your life for us. The least we could do is give our life back to you. God, you are so good. And in your goodness to us, you say that we can come to you, that we can boldly approach the throne of grace with our needs. And like a loving father, that you will listen, you will hear us, and then you will act on our behalf. It's another part of your kindness, God. And God, we bring needs to you today from our family, God. God, I pray for Randall. Elizabeth's friend, God, I pray that you would intervene in this situation in the way only you can and that you would be in the midst there, that you would bring protection, you would bring provision, you would bring what is needed in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for Ella, that God, you would heal her body. Jesus, you took stripes on your back so that Yes, we can be saved for eternity, but right here and now, your word says that by those same stripes, we are healed. And we 
proclaim that Ella is healed in the name of Jesus according to your word. God, there are so many others that need healing in their bodies. God, we continue to pray for Miss Sunshine and for Brandon Fisher, for Carolyn Mackey. God, for all of those that you know, God, would you move in those rooms even now? God, bring healing, and not just healing, but wholeness and health in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for that. We trust you with these needs. And God, we trust you with needs that have not even been spoken out loud in this place today. God, we all have needs. We all have ways that we need to trust you more. God, for every one of those things, God, for those that need provision, God, you said (laughs) that you would meet our needs according to your riches in heaven. And we believe that. We stand upon that word and that promise. God, for those that need restoration in their life, you would you said you would restore the years that the canker worm had stolen. God, we believe that. We stand on your promises and your word. Bring restoration, bring redemption into situations that look hopeless. But you are our hope, Jesus. You're our living hope. We look to you and say we trust you with these situations. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here. As real as if you were standing next to us, we know you are here, Holy Spirit, because you said you would be with us when we gathered in your name. God, don't let us take these promises for granted. They are real. They are the foundation with which we build our lives. We thank you for those promises. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy. And God, we thank you that you are in the midst of us through the Holy Spirit. As we continue through the rest of this service, Holy Spirit, have your way. Not one person, not one personality, not one ministry, not one church, not one denomination deserves any glory nothing stands in your way Holy Spirit we surrender everything to you now Holy Spirit speak convict draw us to you it's another level of your kindness God you draw us to you a holy God and a broken people but you allow us to be in your presence What a kindness to us, God. We say it again, God, you are good, and you are good to us. And we thank you for all of the answers to these requests that are already on the way. We say we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. And we thank you already. Amen. Amen. I don't know what it feels like where you're sitting, but you should be standing up here. <laughs> I'm kidding. The Holy Spirit's everywhere. Okay, don't. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Listen. I thought you were talking to me. I'm sorry. You guys look good again this week. It's not Easter, but you're still dressed up. You look amazing. Listen. Walk around. Tell each other how good you look. Tell them you're thankful to see them on a Sunday morning. Give some hugs and some high fives and some whatever. <laughs> whatever you like to do.
Okay. I love seeing it. I love seeing it. When God's people like each other, it's pretty great. Because <laughs> I don't think every, every church can say that, but I'm glad we can. Because y'all are amazing. Thank you. Listen, I like when you talk back to me, too. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, let's get through a, just a couple of announcements. So we, Let me try again. So that we can get to the Word. Wow, can y'all tell I went to sleep late last night? My bad. <laughs> First of all, welcome. I'm glad to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow, I was beginning to think y'all had just fallen asleep. Y'all sat down, back down and went, oh, that's it, I'm done. Thank you. I'm glad to see all of you. I think most everybody in here has been here at least once, which means your family, because, you know, again, once you're a guest, second time you're family, and then forever. <laughs> you could go to Timbuktu and you're still family. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, two quick things, and they're both about camps. Can y'all believe that the end of school is almost here? It's almost time for summer camps? This is crazy. 2024, the year of the blur. <laughs> That's kind of what it feels like. But two quick things. If your child is at all, or your grandchild, is at all interested in going to kids camp, would you please let Brother Vance, Miss Daphne, Pastor, somebody, let somebody know ASAP so we can get them set up and get them registered for that. The dates for kids camp this year are May 29th through June 1st. Again, that's quicker than we want to talk about. All right? A $25 deposit is due per family, not per child, but per family by Sunday, April 21st. Okay? We, we good with that? 25 bucks. All right. Here's the thing. We welcome any sponsors. <laughs> you guys are generous beyond belief. So if you, you know, you don't have a grandchild or a child and you say, you know what? I got an extra $25 or $100 or $155, whatever you want. Sponsor a child. What an amazing way to invest in the kingdom than through the life of a child going to camp. Also, the youth are going to camp as well. So again, same thing. How about investing in a teenager? But also, if they are interested in going even in the slightest, would you please let Pastor Aaron know? Because he's very anxious to get, you know, them registered for that. Because believe it or not, that first week of camp, which is June the um, 17th through the 21st, it fills up very fast. So we want to get in very quickly and get their reservations in there. It's open to grade 6 through 12. And listen, I speak from experience. I'm not going to tell you how many years of experience. But youth camp will change your life. Completely change your life. It is not just the best week of summer because it's fun. It is that. It's incredibly fun. But it's also God, it's life changing. So if you want to invest in that, let Pastor Aaron know today and now. It is time for me to get out of the way. Thank the Lord. And everyone said amen. And let's get to giving and get to the word. Come on. Can we give God praise for just a minute? There is joy in the house of the Lord today. I did, I'm telling you, there is, just, there is just an atmosphere of praise in this place. There is an atmosphere of God's moving in this place. And God is not done yet. Turn to somebody next to you and say, he's not done. He's not done yet, y'all. Listen, I'm going to brag on you for a minute. Can I brag for a minute? I'm going to brag on you for just a minute. We have just now started the second quarter of our year. Okay? We have just now started our second quarter. And I want to let you know something. God has so rich, richly blessed our people and our church that we have already reached about a third of our mission's goal for the year. I'm telling you, y'all. We God has so blessed us and has so moved in your hearts that you are giving more to missions, or you are blessing the church, and I want to say thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for blessing the church, but more importantly, thank you for blessing the missions. You, you have been a blessing to multiple families in our community and around the world because you said three words. I will 
obey. Because you chose to obey, we were able to bless the Atwell family, the missionaries that was here a few weeks ago. And not just monetarily, we showed them love like they had, had never seen before. And they were impacted by that because you chose to obey. Thank you for what you're doing for the kingdom. Because of you, people across the globe are hearing the word of God today. There's, come on. Because of you, because of you and your obedience, there is food on the table of a missionary or, or, or of indigenous people and God's work is being done. Because of your faithfulness, this service today is being live streamed on the internet as long as the internet is working but it's being live streamed today so that people in our area can hear and see what God is doing inside of our building and inside of our hearts God is moving in those areas I, I, the reason why I bring that up is because I want to I want to mention somebody sunshine we if you don't know miss sunshine she has not been here in a while because she has to stay inside because of the cold uh, because of a certain blood disorder that she has. And she gets very lonely, and she gets to the point where she really, she wants to be here. She called me, uh, I think it was yesterday or, or Friday, it may have been Friday, but she called me. She just said, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm there in spirit. I'm, I'm, I want to be there so bad. She said, but I watch every single week. She's still getting the word because you guys give and because you choose to obey. The reason why we have the equipment, the reason why we're able to do that is because of you. And I want to say thank you for investing in the kingdom. Listen, if you want to invest in the kingdom today, well, uh, before I go there, Paul brags on the Corinthians in his second letter to them. He tells them in verse 10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. Let me say that again. Some of y'all didn't catch that. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food, bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, God will take your seed and multiply it and return it. Now, I'm not saying God's going, if you give a dollar, God's going to give you two. But what I'm saying is, it says for your righteousness, God will show you favor if you obey with a pure heart. If you understand me, say, I do. If you want to invest in the kingdom today, you can do it one of three ways. You can either give on our table in the back. It says tithe and offering. You can give online at ctheaniston.com. Real easy platform there. Or you can mail it into the church. If you understand me, say, I do. Stretch your hands out towards me. Let me pray for you this morning. Father God, today, I pray a blessing over this house. I pray a blessing over the people in this room, God. Lord, those that, that give faithfully, Lord, I pray that you would return it back to them. Those that, that ha, ha, feel that, that urge to give even over and above their tithes, God, I pray that you would send anointing and power over them, that, Lord, you would give them favor, that you would give them uh, 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 rest, that you would give them quality time, whatever it is, however you would choose to return it to them, I pray that you would return it back to them, press down, shake together and running over. Those, Lord, that are wondering if they need what they need to do and how they can start, Lord, I pray that they would start however they can. Lord, tell them, remind them it's about obedience, not about an amount. It's just about obeying your word. Because with obedience comes blessing. We give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Do me a favor. If you would, turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Have y'all been enjoying the sunshine the way that I have? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Come on. I feel the Spirit when I walk outside right now. Now, if I could just get my boat on the water, all would be right in the world. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Listen. Matthew 15, verses 32 through 39. We're going to read that here in just a few minutes. But did you enjoy your Easter season? 
It was gorgeous. We had a great time. God moved in our service last week. We need to learn to leave, our, leave those enemies dead at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stop trying to wake them up and stop trying to bring up the things that would try to separate us. Stop trying to resuscitate our old habits and our old hurts and our old pains. I'm so thankful that they're get dead and gone, but my Savior is alive and well. Amen. We had a great service last week. If you missed it, go back and watch it online. It was an incredible time. But today we're starting something a little bit different. I'm going to start another series today of talks called, called Walk Like a Disciple. Walk like a disciple. How many disciples we got in the house today? Okay, that should be every single one of us. And I can't help when I say this title. When I say this title, I say Walk Like a Disciple. I can't help but think back to when I was a teenager and there was a, there was a, a musical group called the Bengals. Walk like a disciple. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> My, I've been fighting that all week. I finally just gave into it, okay? But listen, I'm starting a new series today. Now, see, listen, I am a fan of a lot of things in my life. I'm a fan of a lot of things. I love, I, I'm a fan of video games. I know I'm, I'm 48 years old and I need to grow up. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. I'm going to go home and play today. But, but I'm, I'm, 40, I'm 48 years old. I still play video games. I love sci-fi. Okay, I've got a few. Come on, sister. Hey, thank you, brother. I, can I get a witness? Oh, the spirit is in this room. Okay, listen. I love sci-fi. I was that weird kid growing up that walked around talking about Star Wars and Star Trek and talked about all the Hercules stuff and all the, the Roman gods and all that. I was that guy that I, I, I paid attention to all that stuff. And some of y'all are going, oh, Lord, we're sitting under this guy. Why are we here? I've grown out of it some. Not completely. I still watch Star Wars at least once a week. No, I'm kidding. It's every other week. Uh, but, but the thing is, I love sci-fi. I love Alabama football. I'm not going to get into that battle tonight I'm not, or today. I'm not going to do it. Uh, I've got Miss Brenda back there. Uh-uh, she's ready to bark like a dog for me today, I'm sure. But uh, that Georgia Bulldog. But listen. I love Alabama football. I love Alabama in, in general. I mean, my son is going there, and he's in his freshman year there, and he's doing a great job. If we sat there last night watching Alabama in the Final Four, and unfortunately they came up a little bit short, that's okay because my, my mood is not, is not changed by whether we win or lose. My mood is not, uh, my, my foundation is not Alabama football. I'm a fan. And I will be sad when they lose, yeah. I was, I've always been a fan, and I, as long as I can remember, except for one small time when I was really, really little, and I jumped on the bandwagon. It was when Miami was really strong at that time. And they had won the national championship. I don't forget what it was, what year it was. But, and I, I said, you know what? Alabama has been so bad for long, I'm going to cheer for Miami. My dad just about slapped my face off. But... <laughs> But, uh, uh, and then I came to my senses. Just, I was sort of like the prodigal son. When he came to his senses, <laughs> he came home. So I, was, I, I came back home. But I've always been an Alabama fo uh, football fan. I, I've also, I'm a huge fan. I know this is going to surprise you. But I'm a huge fan of food. <laughs> Y'all ain't got to laugh so hard. <laughs> if you've been around me for 10 seconds, you know I have an obsession with good food. I, when we go on vacation, I don't care where we go as long as we have a good meal. It doesn't matter to me if we go to, it, it go to a theme park or we go to this or go to that. I want to make sure I've got me a good meal set in front of me and that I'm going to remember. To this day, my, one of my favorite things is we went to, on vacation a couple of years ago. And we went to a specific restaurant that it, we paid ex, extra money for just to make sure that we had a good meal. And that is probably the best steak I've ever had. I'm not going to tell you any more about that because my mouth is starting to water. But listen, okay, hang on. But uh, listen, <laughs> when I gave my life to Christ, there was a fundamental change that came over me. My testimony is very simple. I was doing a lot of stupid stuff as a teenager. Anybody been there? 
I was doing a lot of stupid stuff that, that it was not following God. I, I, when I was little, I served God for a while, but then, like most people, I lost my brain and decided to do some really idiotic things and walked away from God for a short amount of time. But when I gave my life to Christ, something happened inside of me. I decided that I was going to be more than just a fan of God. Because, see, fans can be fair-weather fans. When God is on our side, we're like, Jesus, I love you. You're awesome. But then all of a sudden when that bill comes that we didn't know was there and we don't know how we're going to pay it, we're going, God, I thought you were going to take care of me. You're supposed to take care of this kind of stuff. When we're in good health and when our family's in good health, we're like, Jesus, you're awesome and I love you. But the moment we get a bad report about our little one that's, that's laid in the bed sick and has to take medicine on a daily basis because something severely has gone wrong in their developmental stages, all of a sudden we start pointing a finger at God and going, Why did you do this? Oh, we got quiet up in here. And we start blaming God. See, that's a fan. I decided I was not going to be a fan of God anymore. God doesn't need fans, especially the fair weather kind. This is an issue that we have in our culture today. We have a lot of fans of God, but not a lot of followers. Many declare their Christianity, yet refuse to be disciples. They declare, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, why don't you follow the writings of Jesus and do what he says? Well, I mean, that, that's all up to interpretation. What God, said, what God said, he said. What Jesus said, he said. The truth is the truth no matter where it comes from. Are you with me? It got deep real quick, didn't it? <laughs> There's a book by a guy by the name of Kyle Eidelman called Not a Fan. It, and, and he talks about the definition of a fan. The definition of a fan is an enthusiastic admirer. The definition of a disciple is committed learner follower, student, or pupil. See, I can be a fan of Alabama football. You know what a fan does? A fan goes to the games and cheers and screams and hollers when they do good, but when something goes wrong, they point out every, flaw, every problem and every flaw in the game plan. They're not in the weight room with the, with the team. Fans don't get in and work out with the team. Fans don't get down and study the plays like the team does. Fans don't get in there in the huddle and start talking with them and saying, okay, guys, here's what we need to do. Fans sit on the outside and cheer when things go right and, and boo when things go wrong. Are you with me? What I want you to do today is I want you to come across, I want you to understand we are called to be more than fans of God. God has called us to be more than a fan of who he is, but a follower of what he does. We're not called to be an enthusiastic admirer that comes in here on Sunday morning and sings three songs and worships him for a few minutes and then goes home and lives our life the way that we want to. We're called to be disciples who come in and learn how to live a, 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 a Christ-like life, a life that is pleasing to him. He didn't call Peter and Andrew just so that he would have an entourage everywhere that he went. In Matthew, in Matthew 4, 18 and 19, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting the net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He saw them, and then he said this, And he said to them, Follow me. He didn't say, Be a fan of what I do. When he said follow, he was inviting them. Hey, come and learn from me, and I will make you fishers of men. There is a purpose to following God, and it's not just, just so that we can sit around and get our Holy Ghost goosebumps. Okay, are y'all awake? Are y'all awake? Are we good today? See, not every church will listen to stuff like this, but I know you. See, James and John, James and John, a couple of verses later, he called them, but he didn't call them so that he'd have somebody to buddy up to. I mean, John called himself the one that, God, that Jesus loved, his beloved, 
I mean, he prided himself on that fact. And his name changed, or he changed his own name in his own gospel. And he said, the one that, that he loved, the one that he held dear. And he, 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 he didn't call them just so that he could have somebody to buddy up to. He didn't call the rest of the disciples so that he could give them a great life. So that they could go around and party and have a good time. God has called, God called them so that they would have a purpose, a meaning, a, a, a plan in their life. Are you with me? God has called you and me to be students, learners, and disciples that are continually in the classroom of the Holy Spirit. The moment I, I love, love, love this quote from another pastor. That said, the moment that the teacher, or, or the moment that we, yet yeah, I'm trying to, I'm not going to get it right. It's not in my notes. But basically, it's the moment that the teacher ceases to learn, he becomes irrelevant to the student. The moment we stop learning, we become irrelevant to those that are outside of that, that door. We have to continue moving forward. We have to continually learn. Because I don't know about y'all, there are some things that I learned when I was younger that were wrong. And there are some things that I need to relearn. Are you with me? More than anything, when you walk out of this room today, I want you to understand one simple truth. One sentence that I want you to walk out saying. God has chosen you, his disciple, to be part of his plan and to impact those around you. He, turn to the person next to you and say, he chose you. God chooses you today. He chooses you to impact those around you. God has chosen you. There are people around us on a regular basis that God wants us to be a part of their lives and to give them what they need and to touch their lives. This scripture that we're about to read is an instance where Jesus did this with his own disciples. He chose them for this moment in time in Matthew 15 verses 32 through 39 where it says this. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. He, he had been in, the, he had been in the, the desert or been on the, on the road for more than three days. These people, this crowd, had followed him everywhere that he went. They, had, they were long past their provisions, the things that they had already packed away so that they could eat on the way. All this food was gone. All their drink was gone. Everything that they had was gone. And Jesus looked around. If you look a few verses earlier, it says that he went around healing and teaching, healing and teaching, healing and teaching continually and at this point he looked around and he saw how the people were tired he saw how they were hungry and he said I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way verse 33 and the disciples said to him where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd and Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? We're going to come back to that here in just a minute because I find that question fascinating. How many loaves do you have? They said seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. Verse 37. And they all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. And look at how many there were. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides the women and children. The, the scholars say that there was probably anywhere between, between eight to 12,000 people at this one sitting. Because, uh, you know, there's usually more women and children running around a church service than, than men a lot of times. I'm not going to go there today. 
But the thing is, they, they, and it says in uh, verse 39, and after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went into the region of, of Magadan. Let's pray. Father God, speak to your people. Help us to understand you have chosen us to make an impact. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. I'm going to read that first verse again where it says, Then Jesus called his disciples to him. He called his disciples to him. He called, where did he call them? To himself. He called them to himself. You know, you can't correct or teach somebody from a distance. Are you with me? I know I'm saying that a lot today, but I want to make sure you're, fo- you're tracking with me. I-, I know my train of thought sometimes gets derailed, and I want to make sure I'm staying on track today. Listen, you can't correct or teach somebody from a distance. You ever try to correct or teach a child from a distance? You got a child that's out of your reach and out, out there uh, and all that kind of stuff, and, and you're sitting there, Johnny, Johnny. Sit down, Johnny. Johnny, sit down. Sit down. Johnny, don't put that in your mouth, Johnny. Johnny, 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 stop hitting your stop hitting your sister. Stop hitting your sister. Get her head out of the toilet. And you're sitting there trying to correct. What do you do when you want to correct them? You go to them, right? Or you make them come to you. One of the two. If any of you know, know the comedian, there's a comedian one time, he said, listen, I, he, he, he joked about taking one of those little bark co- or one of those little shock collars, putting it on his kid. <laughs> and he, <laughs> you can t- correct him from a distance with that, but then you'll have to really correct him from a distance when they get you out of jail, okay? But the thing is, you've got to have them close to you. So what did Jesus do when he wanted to teach his disciples? He called them to himself. See, something is lost in translation between our mouths and the ears when there's distance between sometimes. There's, see, my parents, when they were correcting me when I was younger, it was real easy for me to ignore them when I was running around and doing whatever I wanted to do when they're sitting there screaming and hollering at me, Aaron! It's time to come home. And I'm, I'm over here probably over at a buddy's house or something like that. It's real easy for me to go, I didn't hear you. Mommy. I had no idea where I, what you were doing. I didn't hear a word you said. It's real easy to do that. But if I'm standing in front of my dad and my dad says, Son, I told you to take out the garbage. Yes, sir. I'm going to pay real close attention when he's close to me, right? When Jesus wants to get our attention, he draws us close. He draws, when he wants to teach his disciples, he brings them together. There's many cases in the Bible where he says he stole away with them and had intimate conversations. That's that's a theme that has been going through my head for the past couple of months is the intimacy with God. God desires intimacy. He wants us to be close to him. He wants us to spend time with him. Listen, when when in sports, when a team runs a play or when when the coach wants to tell them what to do what does he do he calls them to himself and he they huddle up last night during the Alabama and the Yukon game there was plenty of times where they called time out and the coaches would stand up and walk to the floor and the people would huddle around and he would draw them close and they would talk with one another and talk about their strategy this is exactly what Jesus Christ was doing when he called them in he called them in close to make sure that they understood what he was about to say to them and what was about to happen he wanted to play uh, wanted to call a play and 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 needed them all on the same page with him He had been touching and healing and ministering all across the countryside for three full days. The disciples had been traveling with him, attending to to the needs and attending to his and the crowd's needs all at the same time for the same amount of time, doing God's will and doing what they thought was right. There's plenty of times where we're sitting there and we're doing what we think God wants us to do. We're running around and we're taking care of this situation over here. We're taking care of nursery over here. We're taking care of this. And God's, when, when Jesus called these boys in from the crowd, when he called them in from this entire crowd that he was looking at, he looked at him and said, it was more than just a, come here, boys. I want to spend a little time with you. It was a little more than that. He wanted to speak something into their life, and he wanted them to pay close attention to something. It was a refocusing. It was a time of instruction. 
It was a time to share his plan. He called them in close and began to speak to them about those that they were around and that were around them. Imagine everything that they had been doing, these disciples, okay? I'm, I'm a visual guy, so I, I, I think in movie, in movie clips, okay? So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, while Jesus is sitting there healing this one, you've got, you've got Peter over here uh, uh, sort of doing like the interview process ahead of time. Hey, what do you need from him today? Okay, so your foot, okay, you get over here with the feet people. Okay, you're, it's your eye, let's get you over here with the eye people. And it, they're organizing things. You've got others that are going through the crowd getting testimonials. Now, what did Jesus do for you today? And they're sitting there writing everything now so they have a record of everything. You've got others that are going, hey, you know what? We're going to take up an offering right here. <laughs> okay, I thought that was funny, but... Uh. But, but you've got them doing all of these kind of things. They were doing all kinds of stuff. You've got some ta- tending to people, some taking care of arrangement, arrangements, some of them that were tending to the master's needs. We, we feel the pre- that pressure in our own lives today. Throughout life, we're busy. It's not like the disciples were sitting around doing nothing. But he said, y'all come here. I want to talk to you. Sometimes he wants to call you close, but you're, we, we, or call us close, and we're sitting there, but God, listen, listen, I've got kids, my kids have travel ball practice, or they have ball practice, and we've got travel ball. My boss wants us to work late today, so I can't, I'm not sure that I can go to church tomorrow because I'm going to be so tired, and, and, and we're, we're trying to spend some time with our spouse, and we're, we're, I, I need a date night with my wife or my husband. I need, I need to spend some time with them. The dog really needs to be taken to the vet. I've got this friend that really needs to talk. I've, I've got, I, I volunteer in this ministry and I get involved in this ministry and I really don't have time to spend time studying your word like I should and spending time in prayer like I should, God. So I, you'll understand because I know I need to be busy. We can get so busy doing ministry like the disciples and forget why we came here in the first place. We've got a lesson to prepare for children's class or we volunteered to help and that we volunteered to help and we have a worship team practice or it's my turn to make the meal for Bible study or I want to take the pastor out to lunch and tell him how great he is <laughs> oh I feel the spirit in that no, just kidding 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 can I share something with you Just because you're doing the work of God doesn't mean you're spending time with God. God wants you to do more than just study so that you can teach others. He wants you to study and spend time with Him so that He can speak to you. You know, these messages that I preach every single Sunday, they have to preach to me first. They've got to change me first. Because if it doesn't change me, it's not going to be something that I can convey to you. It's not going to be passionate. It's not going to be something that's inside of me. I can't give you something I don't have. That's why I've got to spend my own personal time in study. That's why I've got to spend my own personal time in prayer. And I'm going to be honest with you. God has been kicking my tail lately telling me, hey, I want to spend some more personal time with you. And I'm having to say, yes, sir. And as soon as I say, yes, sir, all of a sudden, everything, everything in the world wants to steal my time away from him. We have to be intentional about spending time with God. Are you with me? Sometimes we need to come. We need to come in from the crowd and spend time with the one. God wants, us to, u- wants to use us to impact those around us, but we have to be connected to him in order to do it. Jesus understood this when he, when he said this in John 15, 5. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me. We talked about that word abides a long time ago. That word abide means lives in, spends time with uh, makes his home there. He who abide, whoever abides in me, and I in him, he he it is, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We can't do anything without Jesus. Let me simplify that whole verse. You gotta have Jesus in order to do what He wants you to do. That's the, that's the PAV, Pastor Aaron version. As disciples, we need to slow down 
and hear the call of our coach saying, all right, guys, huddle up. Come on, folks. Come on, church. Let's huddle up and let's spend some time. That's what we do every Sunday morning when we come down here for prayer. We huddle up. I'll turn the music down and I'll I'll step down here. If we could gather at the front, I'm just going to start saying, huddle up. I'm not going to go so far as to say, take a knee. But but we huddle up so that we be on the same page, so that we can make sure that we're doing what he wants us to do. And, and how, do, how do I do that, Pastor Aaron? How do, I, how, do I, how do I spend time with God? How do I huddle up with him? By drawing close to him and listening to his call on our lives. His word and his presence. It's that simple. You spend time in his word and in his presence. I know, I know we're all busy, but if you're too busy to spend some time with God, then you're too busy. If I'm too busy to spend some time with my wife when she needs me, I'm too busy. Because our relationship is important. How important is your relationship with God? Is it more important than a, than a ball game? Is it more important than, than a sales call? Is it more important than a bill? Come on. Are you with me today? We need to shut out the noise around us. We will always hear the heartbeat of God clearer the closer we lean into Him and when we answer the call to come close. God wants to use you to impact the world, but we've got to come close to Him first. If you're with me, say, I am. Once Jesus got the disciples' attention, he shares with them the driving force and the reason why he's called them together. Verse 32 says, Then Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. It was Christ's love that showed him what the people needed. I am moved with compassion. And, I, and because of that, I see they've got nothing to eat. His love was a magnifying glass for the need of the people. His love showed him, that, showed him what the people needed. His love was like a magnifying glass on their situation. It caused him to pay greater attention to them. It alerted him to a need. Jesus couldn't bear to send them away. It says, I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. He was unwilling. He could not bear to send them away in their current state of being in want and being in need. He was compelled to act on their behalf. Can I tell you something? God wants to use you to impact those around us or use us to impact those around us, but he can't do it unless we view the people the way he did, through the lens of love. We have to look at every person that we see in life through a lens of love, not as a lens of of judgment or condemnation. Not as a lens of why aren't they doing this? Why don't they do it my way? See, love changes the way we see things. It changes how we see our spouses. I, I, I know this is going to come as a shock, and I've said this before, but I am not a perfect man. Okay, thank you for not saying amen. But my wife, she looks at me, and especially when we were dating, she looks at me, and we looked at each other, And it was like all of a sudden angels came down from the sky. There was a halo that came down and rested upon our heads. There wasn't a blemish on our face. And I had washboard abs. Maybe that was my dream. I don't know. But but the thing is, love changes the way we look at each other. 
See, when I look at Amy, I don't see her flaws. When she looks at me, hopefully she doesn't see my flaws. Because what love does is love covers those flaws with what they love about us. And love covers those flaws with forgiveness. Love covers those, those flaws with understanding. Love covers those flaws with, with, with the power to say, you know what? I love you just the way you are. Even though you don't cut your toenails, I still love you. Even though you snore and you sound like a bear, I love you. My wife can attest to that because I will do that. Love changes the way we look at each other romantically. In a romantic situation, it will change that. It changes how we see our kids. Listen, I love y'all. And I know you think that your kids, your Johnny or your Susie, is the perfect little angel that never does anything wrong. And that, they, 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 that, that angels follow them around going, oh, you're so wonderful. You're so great. And your teachers, that their teachers are looking at you going, oh, they're such a joy to be in class. But what they're not telling you is that they want to wring their neck 95% of the time. Listen. But because we love our kids, we look at them and say, you know what, even though they get on my nerves, even though they ask too many questions, even though they don't do things immediately when I ask them to do it, I still love them. In spite of their flaws, in spite of the situation. Love changes the way we look at them. When we look at people around us with a Christ-like love, love takes on that... Love, we take on the character of Christ and we see them through his eyes. Love changes how we view the cashier that was rude to us. Love would tell us maybe they've had a bad day. Or love would tell us maybe they've got something going on that we don't know about. Love will change how you respond and how you view them. Christ-like love changes our view of that cashier. Christ-like love alters how we see, how we see uh, and view those loud, obnoxious teenagers that won't shut up. When, they, when, they, when, when they're causing such a ruckus and such a problem that we can't pay attention, uh, the, the, the love of Christ looks at them and says, you know what, they need to hear the word too. They need to understand that they belong. See, Christ-like love transforms our thoughts about a homeless person. Instead of looking at them and going, man, they should do better for themselves. It looks at them and says, what can I do to help them? Is in our way or somebody that, that, that makes the area look a little trashy. We look at them and go, you know what? God looks at them and sees a son or a daughter. God looks at them and sees somebody that is valuable, somebody that, that, that he, he gave his son for. Christ-like love takes our attitude about that person who did us wrong and flips it on its head. That person who said those horrible things about us and, and, and spoke such lies about us and screamed and hollered at us. And, and they sit there and they, 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 they talked about us behind our back. And they sit there, and it, it, but it, we look at them and the human response is, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm a grown person and I'm going to take care of this. But the love looks at him and says, you know what, I know who I am. And I'm going to pray that God will reveal who my real character is to you. You know, I've always said, when someone attacks me, I usually keep my mouth shut. Because God challenged me uh, years ago to let my character defend me. What you do says a whole lot more than what you say. And if you fire back, it says a lot about you. Are you with me? Listen. Listen. When we see through the lens of love and grace, we will recognize the needs of those around us. And that is when God will use, the, use his disciples to touch people around us. That's when God will say, do something about it. He called the disciples in and he said, listen, here's the need. Now that you see it through my eyes, let's do something about it. 
They heard the call and came. They heard his heart and saw the need. But there was still a problem, though. The problem was this. The math wasn't mapping. Amy loves that phrase. That's why I threw that in there. The math wasn't mapping. They looked around and they looked at Jesus and they said, uh, Jesus, listen, I understand. You see the crowd, right? You see all these people, right? This ain't working. Because where are we going to find food in a desolate place like this? Where are we going to, where, where are we going to find food for all of these people? See, what they had to offer and the need that they saw did not add up. It was back about you've got 4,000 men, seven loaves of fish, or seven loaves of bread and, and, and a few fish. And they're going, yeah, one of these things is not like the other. And they're going back and forth, back and forth. And they, and they say, listen, we, we, we don't know about this. Verse 33, verse 33 says, And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in, in, in such a desolate place? To feed so great a crowd. And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few small fish. Jesus was not deterred. He was not shocked. He, was, he didn't wring his hands and go, oh my, how are we going to feed all these people? How are we gonna, what are we going to do, guys? Listen, I, never mind the fact that I just fed 5,000 two chapters ago. He's not wringing his hands going, I don't know what we're going to do, guys. I don't know what we're going to do. Jesus was not deterred. He was not, he was not shocked. He did not change his mind. His plan was still the same as, we, as when this whole mess started in verse 32 when he refocused them on the need. He knew exactly what he was going to do when he pointed out the need. He knew exactly how to solve the problem when, when he showed them how to look at them with love. Notice Jesus' question, though. Notice Jesus' question. He still wanted to provide. He wanted to use the disciples to, uh, for a miraculous provision for these people. Notice his question. How many loaves do you ask or do you have? He did not ask them how much it would take. He did not ask them what they were lacking. He asked them, what do you have? God is so desiring of using us and his disciples to touch those around us. But we have a tendency to tell him why it won't work. We have a tendency to look at him and say, say well, well, God, listen, listen, I know you want me to teach, but I'm not a teacher. I'm not a teacher, God. Uh-uh. That's not me. I don't, have, I, don't have, I don't have that ability within me. I don't have something inside of me that says, I, I want to teach teenagers or I want to teach kids. God has called us as a church and as a body of believers to impact our community. Amen? We're supposed to impact our community. We're supposed to go out and touch lives all across Anniston and Oxford and Calhoun County and every area around. And we're supposed to go out and touch Saks. We're supposed to touch all of those areas, White Plains, Weaver, all of those areas. We're supposed to minister in all those places. But listen, God may have called us to touch, touch our entire community, but he also called us as disciples to impact those that are immediately next to us. I want to impact the entire county the same way everybody else does. I want to see this entire place filled to the brim. I want to see, us, I want to see people in here stacked up like cordwood. Okay? I want to see all of that. But you know what? I'm more interested in ministering to the person next door to me than I am the one across town right now. Because if I minister to the person next door, and then I move to the door, next door to that, and then I move next door to that, I'm eventually going to work my way around into the entire community. We have to learn it's the person next to us that we've got to start with. Are you with me? So many times we look around and wonder how in the world are we going to reach this entire community was so little. Can I, can I confess something to you? I am not enough to do it. As a matter of fact, this entire weekend, God, I mean, I, I've been, I've had, I have this little voice that speaks to me. I don't know if y'all do or not. That tells me you ain't ever, you, you're not smart enough. You're not, you're not good enough. 
You don't, you're not talented enough to touch lives the way that, that, that you're supposed to. You, you keep talking about reaching the entire community, yet you, you, you struggle to talk to the person next to you in, the, in line. And I, and I struggle with being enough. I'm, I'm your pastor, okay? I am one of you. Because there's times where I look and I say, I'm not enough. And I, I, God, I don't know why you called me to Anniston. I don't know why you called me to Calvary Temple. Because I'm not good enough to do what you want me to do. God doesn't ask us to be good enough, though. He just asks us to give him what we have. God's not asking you to be good enough to reach the entire community. He's asking you to be good enough to reach your neighbor. He's not asking you to have the oratory skills of Billy Graham so that you could stand out in the middle of, of the square at Oxford and preach the word of God so that people would run to the altar and, and, and fall, at, fall at your feet saying, oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful. What he wants is somebody that's going to go next door, knock on the door and say, hey, is there anything I can pray with you about today? I just wanted to check on you. I hadn't talked to you in a while. Are you with me? I know I sound like a broken record, but God wants to use you in what you have. He wants to know what you have. He, want, he doesn't want you just to walk out and try to touch the entire community, but he wants you to touch that neighbor who's struggling to put food on the table. He doesn't want you to, he, he, he's not asking you to change the entire city, but to bring hope to that single mom who feels like she's failing her kids because she can't spend time with them. What he's asking you to do is not to, not to make a teenager or, or not, not, to, not to reach an entire generation, but he's asking you to make a teenager who feels like they're invisible at home feel like you see them when they walk through the doors and that they belong here. He's not asking you to fill this entire church, but he's asking you to fill the seat next to yours. Are you with me? That's what we're supposed to do as disciples. Here is something special I want you to see, and I'm going to need some volunteers. And VJ, if you'll go ahead and come, I'm going to need some volunteers. If if you're in this room, and you are, let's say, uh, 20 years old or younger, stand up. I knew I was going to get y'all first. Let's say 25 and under. 25 and under, stand up if you would. Okay, uh, Bree, you're stuck. Well, I'll tell you what, the four of y'all, if y'all would, come up here. And I, I need some, uh, some other folks. Brother Charles, I want you to come on up. Miss Claire, come on up with them. Because you know what? Our, our young people, they need, they need guidance from those that are a little bit older and have a little bit more wisdom. Amen? Sometimes. But sometimes these teenagers can teach us just as much. Are you with me? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. But I'll tell you what, I'm, 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 I want one more person. One more person. Can I have a volunteer? Just a volunteer. One person. Come on up here, Eric. Now I want you to understand something. I'm going to walk away from my notes for a minute. Because Jesus took seven loaves of bread. Okay? Now, yes, I've got more than seven up here, right? Or I've got at least seven. No, I've got seven up here. But I'm, I'm not going to give, use all of this right now. Because what, what, what I'm going to do is he took the bread. What, the Bible says that he took the bread and he broke it. And then he handed it back. Are you with me? So I'm going to take this bread right here. This is, and, and what he would do is he would take that bread and he would break it and he would hand them a piece. He would hand them a piece. And he would take it and he went down all the way through his entire, his entire uh, group. Some of them were a little smaller. Some of them were a little bigger. Some of, them, some of them were a little fresher, some of them wasn't. But, but the thing is, he would hand it to them. After he took it and he broke it, he would hand it to them and say, okay, now go. Now, I want you to notice something. When What I started with was this. When Jesus received it, it was this. But he took it and he broke it and made it smaller. And I'm sure as he handed it back to the disciples that all of a sudden they're sitting there going and they're, they're looking at that bread in their hand. And let me squeeze in here real quick. They're looking at that bread in their hand and they're sitting there going, 
Jesus. I mean, listen, listen. Uh, their bread's bigger than mine. They're, they're going to, hey, I don't know how this is going to work. I'm not sure this is going to work, Jesus. You see, Jesus asked them for what they have. And they gave it. But then he gave it, or he, he took it, prayed over it, and blessed it, and gave it right back to them. Notice the Bible doesn't say that God instantly multiplied it. I know I'm completely off of my notes, Brad. I apologize. But, but he, he handed it back to them the exact same. Actually, he handed it back to them even smaller. Sometimes when God actually shows you what you have, it may look even smaller than what you thought it was. But it's still able to be used by him. Understand this today. What you give God, he gives back to you. So that you can go out and, and, and experience what his miracles can do. You see, this is what I find funny. We sit there and we want, we want God, we want God to take our talent, our little bit of talent, and say, okay, God, if you want me to reach this entire community, then what I want you to do is I want you to multiply this. Make it to where I'm great so that I can. But God didn't, doesn't do that. When, if he had handed the bread back to them and it multiplied immediately, and they had enough to feed 4,000 men in just that instance of time, then, then what would have happened to the disciples? They would have been buried in that bread. You know, it took them actually taking what God gave back to them and taking it out and breaking it off and handing it to somebody and changing lives it, by actually doing a work to actually make a difference. When God, when, when, when God asks you to do something, it, He's not going to automatically multiply your talent to where everything's going to feel comfortable. Don't you know that these disciples, they probably felt pretty stupid walking up to a group of 50 people going, uh, here you go. Yeah, y'all enjoy. And as they're passing it around, as they're passing the bread around, they go, hey, Johnny, Johnny, don't take such a big piece. No, don't give any to the dog. We gotta have it to go all the way around. Get a crumb. You don't eat much anyway. But the disciples didn't question Jesus. They took what little he gave back. You see, his blessing makes it enough when we step out in faith and start using it as enough. Are you with me? Give my helpers a hand. Y'all can just drop that bread over there. I know that's a simple illustration. But it's so real. We have to understand something as disciples. Jesus will take what little we have and he will bless what we have and he will put it back in our hands. It is when we start using what he has blessed in us is when the miraculous happens. Stand with me today. What God wants to do today is to take what you have as his disciple, however little it might be in your eyes, and bless it. He wants to put it back in your hands and say, now go and do what I've called you to do. You may be sitting there and going, I've got a little. God, I've got seven loaves and a few fishes, but it ain't going to feed this entire community. It's not going to be enough to teach a class. It's not going to be enough to really, really do anything major. God didn't ask you to do anything incredible. He just asked you to obey. He asked you to be his disciple and to learn God chooses you to make a difference it, that's, that's the past 45 minutes wrapped up in one sentence some of y'all are sitting there going wow 
Why didn't you say that to begin with? We could have gotten to the restaurant about a half hour ago. Because I believe there's times that we need to spend at God's feet, letting Him speak to us about what is in our hand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're in this room today. And you're sitting there going, God, uh, Pastor Aaron, I, 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 I want to do great things for God. And I feel like God wants me to do, do something for Him. But I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Right now, I want God to pour over this place. In the name of Jesus, with every head bowed, every eye closed, Jesus, today, speak to hearts about what they have. Speak to hearts about what you want them to do. Speak to hearts about what little is in their hands and let them give it to you. But God, let them understand that you're going to return it back to them and that they're going to have to step out in faith and start using it for you. I'm going to end this way. I'm going to ask that everyone who is physically able, if you would, I'd like for you to come to the front for just about five minutes. And let's just start asking God, God, what do you want from me today? What do you want from me today? What do you want to use inside of me to touch lives around me? Today, God is challenging us to look inside of us. Listen, do you want to be used by God? Let me ask it again, and I want an answer. Do you want to be used by God? Then what are you putting in His hands? What are you offering to Him? Don't wait on me to come and pray for you right now. I want you to close your eyes and lift your hands and say, God, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? What is in my hands that you need me to put in yours? Today, God, challenge us. Challenge us, Lord. God, speak to us about what little we have. Let your spirit speak to us, Lord, about the fact that you have called us to do more than what we think we can. God, if we try to do it in ourselves, we will fail because we are not enough. (coughs) But it's when we put it in your hands that it becomes enough. It's when we step out in faith and start to work for you. That's when we become enough. That's when things become enough so that we can touch lives. God, today, give us a burden for the lost, Lord. Give us a burden for those that are next door to us. Give us a burden for those that are around us. God, let us see through the eyes of love. Let us see through the lens of love. In Jesus' name, Lord. God, today I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you everything that I am. I give you my talents. I give you my lack. I give you everything. And I say, do what you want with it. We are not enough, but you are more than enough. Come on, church. Seek his face. Seek his face. God, in the name of Jesus, I know, I know you have great things in store. But God, help us to focus in on the ones next door to us. Let us focus in on, 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 on the ones that are, that, are, that are in need, that are close to us. God, in the name of Jesus, show us who we need to minister to. Show us who we need to touch. Show us who we need to touch in our lives, God. In Jesus' name, Lord. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. Oh. Come on and sing that together. Oh, I, I surrender. Lord, we give everything to you. I surrender all. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Church, God is preparing us. 
He's preparing us for what's coming. He's preparing us for the future. But we have to be prepared to put what we have in His hands. However small it is. However small an action or however, however much it scares us. He just asks us, will you put it in my hands? He's chosen you to make a difference. God, prepare us. Prepare us for what you have in store. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Church, has it been good to be in his house? Has this made sense today? Then as we leave, don't leave the same as when you came in. Leave with a little bit of something in your hand and start handing it out. I guarantee you, you're not going to run out. The disciples never ran out. They handed it to everybody. When God uses you, you're not going to run out. As a matter of fact, he, he brought back more than what he gave in the beginning. Because they walked away with seven baskets full of extras. God will take your broken pieces and still make them usable. Are you with me? Lord Jesus, take us home safely. Bring us back safely. Give us divine appointments as we leave this room. And let us change someone today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. We love you, fellas.